on each table, there's one of these microphones. If you're going to speak, just slide it towards you, press the button so the light turns green. That means it's on. You'll hear it coming through these speakers back here. And then the people at home will also be able to hear. Okay, let's try to, one of you, are they your members, Andrew? It, well, it seems like a mix. Um, I know I see uh, Mayor Silvestrini from Mill Creek, Commissioner Bolos from Weber County, Commissioner Powers Gardner from uh, Utah County, um, uh, Commissioner Almquist from Washington County, Myron Lee from Dixie MPO, uh, and there's, I can't see everybody who is in the meeting. Peter Hadley from FTA Region 8, and then whoever's showing the screen, could you um, show it so that we can see all of the participants, just so we make sure we don't miss anybody? Please. Okay, terrific. Kay Neves representing Mayor Kafusi from uh, Provo City, uh, Michelle Larson from UTA, and then now you can see everybody who, uh, who's online. So thank you, Carlos, very much. I don't know what they did. So back in May of 2001, we did the opening of the I-15 project in Salt Lake County, and we were beginning the EIS for I-15 from 106 South all the way through Utah County. I remember Governor Levitt stood at Point of the Mountain. We were up where the hang gliders are, and uh, he announced that effort for us to move forward, and it actually moved forward as a multimodal EIS, and the commuter rail and I-15 were together through up until the draft, but federal highways and FTA have different requirements for NEPA documents, so at the draft, those two documents got split apart. There was a lot of discussion at that time because the urbanized areas were growing together. And there was discussion of whether or not uh, MAG and Wasatchewan Regional Council should be one planning organization so that we had consistency at the boundary between uh, the two MPOs because if we have these two major projects that are crossing the MPO boundary, it was critical that we have the same planning, planning processes, the same data across those boundaries. And so the, a lot of discussion around this, and it was very difficult uh, discussions, obviously, but Daryl Cook, who was head of the uh, Mount Land Associated Government at the time, came up with the idea of JPAC. And it was this committee that we're sitting in today this committee was meant to bring together basically that boundary between Utah County and Salt Lake County so that as these urbanized areas start to merge, we can have consistency in that planning process. And uh, JPAC became identified by the legislature as a best practice when in the planning, um, the legislative uh, interim planning study that they did in 2003, 2004, I mean, a lot of big things came out of that, that committee. Uh, President Adams was actually a brand new House member at the time. Senator Kilpack was a new senator at the time. They served on this committee. It was chaired by Representative Lockhart, Becky, and by uh, Carlene Walker, uh, Senator Walker with the two chairs. Um, but one of the things that happened during that committee is they asked us, what are your plans? And all of us, so every, the four MPOs laid the long range plan on the desk in front of, I, I remember this moment, it was very clear, in front of Representative Lockhart. UDOT laid the rural transit plan and UTA had a, I mean, transportation plan and UTA had their transit plan. And she looks at this stack of plans and she said, why can't you people get together? And one of the recommendations out of that planning task force was that JPAC was identified as a best practice. And so I look back at that point as really helping define the purpose behind why we come here together. It's to coordinate that 
planning efforts that we have between the different regions, between the different modes, and it's an opportunity to talk about what assumptions we have. And I think it's become, you know, it's over the time it's grown statewide. We have our uh, our MPOs around the state joining us as well, and it's it's really is a best practice that I would tell any other state um, to try to emulate. So. I'll just leave that history with this. Uh, Wasatch Front is still hosting um, the documents the, the, uh, and the uh, signed agreements, Andrew, I believe, for this. Um, yes. On and your it's website. A, it's a shared effort. Um, yes, and Carlos, thank you so much for the history. I just I want to add a very brief supplement to that, which is you're noting that JPAC is a is a is a model that has also been recognized nationally. Yeah. The Federal Highway Administration um, per periodically produces um, models of uh, regional and state collaboration, and they have cited JPAC as one of the examples for other states to utilize to coordinate transportation. And then they've also noted one of the sort of um, ultimate product of our JPAC work is Utah's unified transportation plan that emerges in part out of the work of JPAC and all of our agencies coordinating together. And in fact, just preceding this meeting, all of our agencies were meeting for several hours to work on the details of that coordination, which we will not go over all of that in this meeting today. You wouldn't want to go that deep, but, um, but the collaboration is, is really meaningful and JPAC is a significant part of that. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. And so, a couple things, a couple reasons why I mentioned that to you is at the end of our agenda, we have uh, topic 5B. We're going to want to have a conversation with everyone on what are those elements you would like to discuss? What would be important for us as a collective to be able to talk about, to make decisions on, make recommendations on? Um, so be thinking about that as we're going through the agenda today. And I will. Let me do a check here. Did we ever get a plow outside? Okay. Okay. So this was dependent on weather, um, but if at the end of the meeting, if you have a few extra minutes and you want to actually go out and sit in a snow plow, it's, it's a different perspective. Um, get your picture in there and we can actually tell people you're doing real work today. Um, but it, <laughs> We can pretend sometimes, but but it's it if if it's truly there, we'll know before the end of the meeting. It will be out back here, just out the back door, so easy to get to. And I uh, thought it might be something fun for you to be able to check out. So, other than that, I would uh, propose Jay. I think you weren't here when we did introductions, and and I see another. New joining us. Thank you, Muriel. Anyone else not get introduced? Okay, so um, oh, and online. Yeah, um, Commissioner Fackrell from Morgan County joined us, and um, other staff from several, some of the other agencies have joined as well. Thank you, Andrew, for helping. Oh, and Mayor Merrill oh. from Alpine is with us as well. Great. Well. Okay, guys, thank you very much for joining us. And let's move to agenda item number two, um, approval of the December 7th meetings. I will look for a motion. Uh, move to approve. Motion by Carlton Christensen. Do we have a second? Andrew Gruber. Thank you, Andrew. Discussion to the motion? Seeing none, all in favor say aye. Thank you very much. I'll move that passes. Um, let's move on to item number three, state topics. And we're going to do a legislative uh, roundup here. And this is free for all. So we will, uh, we will have folks present some, some topics. And we're looking for questions or comments or whatever might come out of this. So, uh, and please, um, let's continue eating, except for our presenter. So, I'm going to ask Peter, who's part of our legislative policy team, to uh, present because Leif Elder is driving his family down to St. George for a track meet. Uh, thank you, Carlos. Hey, I'm uh, trying to share here, and it's... Uh...
Is it, let's see if it's working this time. Okay, let me see if I can get it to go. Okay. Oops. Get it to the right one, huh? Sorry, I'm just. So, uh, um, I tried to get as as annoying pictures to go with all these as I could. The, we're just going to go through some of uh, the significant legislation that passed this last session, and as Carla says, feel free to to jump in and add your take or your understanding of things. The first bill we're talking about here is the transportation amendments, which is, uh, we often call the, whatever the big cleanup bill of the year is, the omnibus bill. And this is from Senator Harper. And this, uh, some of the thing, this one covers a lot of little changes in the law, but significantly it authorizes UDOT to provide public transit services in consultation with any rel relevant public transit provider. That's for, uh, that would mean UTA, and that's kind of just uh, for the future for us trying to think of ways to get people up Cottonwood Canyon during the winter time. Uh, it also includes implementation and enforcement of federal grant obligations, allows UDOT to do that again as part of UDOT's uh, role in doing capital projects capital transit projects to make sure that we have that authority and uh, and obligation to meet federal requirements for grants. It allows us to use uh, $500,000 out of TTIF for studies. And, and it also, if, if uh, UDOT is the one who is suggesting uh, the, the project, then it doesn't require a local match because it didn't make sense for the state to have to match the state. So uh, it also uh, made it illegal to store flammable materials under bridges due to some horrific accidents in other states. We thought it was a good idea to be safe. Um, and, and then we did a favor for the Salt Lake Airport that hadn't abandoned plane that they couldn't get rid of <laughs> and so we changed the law a little bit to, to make it clear that they can dispose of that airplane i don't know does anybody uh you know raise your hands or whatever if if there's any of these you want to discuss more about so uh, let's see for well, I don't know. The law's just passed now, so I don't know. Well, <laughs> it doesn't. It's not in effect yet till uh, May. So yeah. that was such a fascinating. Like, well, it was. Background. It was an interesting situation because it's like I'm going to get the number wrong. It's like fifteen dollars for five years to register through FAA, and the, if a plane was abandoned, you couldn't. The airport authority couldn't get rid of it if it was still registered. So they they I guess have several very unworkable usable aircrafts that have been I, I have a hard time picturing some i'm going to just abandon my plane but. yeah and there's still protections if you're making active steps to fix it or things like that so it's not it's not a steal steal the plane bill it's a get rid of things that truly are abandoned so peter i was just oh, gonna sure i was just gonna mention that um one clarification that seems minor but was important this year is that um, uh, in the appointment process of the trustees in Tooele County, it had still the old form of the commissioner form of government and didn't reflect the new one. And, and um, my colleagues going through that reappointment process, so to get that clarified this year in particular was important. So we appreciate the senator because we kind of caught it after the fact and he got it corrected. So, Yeah. And and that's um, one thing I'd like to say uh, on behalf of the legislature. They are so cooperative <laughs> with our organizations that uh, it's very easy to get time with them and, and for them to listen to our concerns and be responsive. It's a, it's a, a great working relationship that I hope 
continues. So, um, Peter, I have a question on that. Sure. You said it doesn't make sense for the state to meet match the state funds in order to get grants. So I'm just thinking, a city who is a subdivision of the state, does it make sense that a city should have made match funds to get there? Just that makes perfect question. sense. And and that was our our challenge: is how is this going to be taken advantage of? Sorry. <laughs> uh, now this is uh, HB 488, transportation funding modifications. I had a great picture of a bullet train, but Andrew made me take it off because uh, it was it was more a joke on the commentary on the first picture. Uh, but th this started out as a very small bill, and by the time it finished up, it did. Once it got to the Senate, it did uh, became an entirely new bill, and the, we'll talk about some of the big changes here. Are that it shifts uh, fifty million dollars ongoing from TIF by taking one percent of that money that would go to TIF and puts it to TTIF, and the legislature uh, bought into that idea. It was also part of the governor's budget that once we start to get a consistent, reliable amount of money annually, it's a lot easier to plan projects in the future when you're not chasing project by project, but that you have a consistent fund that's always going. Uh, this also changed CC TIF, which is the Cottonwood Canyons TIF, funding from a $20 million cap to a 0.44% of that same sales tax, which is right around $20 million, but it means it can grow in the future. So it didn't really so much change the amount right now, but it will, going forward, it takes off the cap. And then I think maybe uh, WFRC wanted to talk about that. Do you, yeah, Miranda, do you want to discuss maybe the other things that 488 does? Sure. Yeah, I could touch on a few of the other um, notable things in the bill. And Peter, I just want to reiterate the uh, shift of the fifty million from the TIF to the TTIF. Um, this is a really notable thing that I, I think came out of the legislative session this year. Um, you know, the legislature, I think, historically uh, over the past several years, I'm sorry, these mics are really challenging. I have started to put more um, more state resources towards transit as the years have gone on. And this is a uh, another significant and notable investment in the Transit Transportation Investment Fund, stable ongoing funding for transit. I will note that in the um, legislation it did, it will shift that, you know, $50 million into a um, commuter rail restricted account. So the shift or this increase, the focus will be on the state's front runner commuter rail system. Um, but again, as we know, that system is the, um, the backbone of our region here on the Wasatch Front and uh, is, you know, the backbone of our transit system. And so, again, just a really, uh, really notable thing coming out of session this year. Um, Peter mentioned Cottonwood Canyon Transportation Investment Fund. Um, this bill also made some changes to local option sales taxes. Um, notably, in Salt Lake County, it uh, expanded uses for the county portion of the fifth fifth local option sales tax, if imposed, um, to be used uh, in addition to transportation for public safety. Um, Salt Lake County hasn't imposed the fifth fifth local option sales tax uh, yet, but um, you know, given given this change, that might be a further incentive for them to do so. Uh, it also expands the second quarter 0.30% local option sales tax um, for public safety in third through sixth class counties. Um, again, providing additional flexibility um, for imposition um, and, and uses of those funds. <clears throat> and then, I'm sorry, I'm trying to see what else Peter has up here. Um, it, with the fifth fifth allocation, it does um, provide for funding for the 5600 West Express um, bus service that UTA sought through an appropriations request this session. 
um, kind of funded in a, in, a, in a different way. But again, if Salt Lake County imposes the fifth, fifth then um, some of those funds would be able to go towards the 5600 West Project, which, uh, as UTA would share, has a, 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 about a $4 million gap left in, in finishing and funding that project. Uh, additionally, it, uh, pro this bill provided funding um, for a number of specific projects um, out of the County of the First Class Highway Projects Fund. This is a legislatively directed fund um, funded by local option sales taxes, and there's about $45 million of specific projects within Salt Lake County that were funded with, um, with that account. Um, in addition to the County of the First Class Highway Projects Fund, uh, there also was the creation of the County of the First Class Infrastructure Bank, um, which uh, UDOT might be able to speak better to exactly how that will how that will work moving forward. But um, it did include some specific projects to be paid uh, with those um, infrastructure bank loan funds repayments. Um, those were three uh, specific projects. If, again, if the fifth fifth was imposed, thanks, Andrew. And uh, I think that kind of covers the, the majority of what's in this bill. As Peter said, it kind of was a, there was a lot in here um, that wasn't originally in the bill, but there really is, there's a, quite a significant amount of um, things done in this bill. So thanks, Peter. Yeah, and the infrastructure bank is, is kind of interesting in that it says that it can loan money out for infrastructure and then when it comes back, it's to be spent on a specific project. So it's sort of a, a plan to loan it out once and then use it for something else. And I guess we'll, we'll, we'll have to see how, how, that, how well that works. So. Lenise? Yeah, thank you. I just want to make one note um, on House Bill 488. The changes to the local option sales taxes do not impact any, um, anything for Utah County. So just want to make that clear for Utah County folks. Or, or, or Davis or Weber. For the, for the other class counties, they have an allowed uh, additional flexibility in how they can use their, is it third quarter? Second quarter. It's a second quarter that has not been imposed in any third or six class counties right now. So it's an, it's an option that's on the books has not been imposed. If they impose it, it can be used for transportation and or public safety. And if anybody wants to consider that, talk to us about it because it's a little more complicated than even what's been presented <laughs> here about the bill. Okay, uh, the next one up on the list is SB 51 road construction bid limit amendments. I have a, a book cover here on act as if it act as if, think it into existence, because this is a bill we thought was a really good idea and we were gonna go talk to legislators about it and then it just popped up uh, out of thin air from Senator Winterton, uh, had the same good idea without us having to ask for it. This increases the bid limit for, uh, it's for local roads, mostly in the code change, it's local roads increasing the bid limit to $350,000 for what you can, how much the project can cost before you have to go to an outside contractor. There's a, there's a section of code that also says UDOT will follow the same formula for its projects. So, yeah, and so it, the, the other significant change besides raising that amount is now that it indexes future increases to the National Highway Construction Cost Index instead of to the Consumer Price Index, which is a, a, a more realistic measure of inflation for these kinds of projects. Uh, one little uh, inside baseball that I've already found out about is that the National Highway Construction Cost Index is quite delayed in its reporting compared to the consumer price index. It lags quite a bit. And so making the annual changes line up is, is gonna present a little bit of a challenge, but we'll, we'll figure it out. They run about six months 
behind uh, when they actually publish, you know, what happened. They haven't published yet how last year ended. <laughs> so, um, but we consider this a, a good change. And I think we talked with the Association of Contractors. They were okay with it and everything. So, And I want to add on to that, too, that that's really important for like our community. We hit that limit every year. Yeah. And it limited what we could do. So this will free up our opportunity to do more work. So we're really pleased with that one. Uh, this is HB 74, a simple, simple bill to get to agreement on <laughs> over a year and a half. Uh, this is a uh, utility relocation cost sharing amendments as UDOT got tasked with um, doing capital projects for transit. Uh, UDOT was interested in having the same kind of utility relocation agreements that we get for transportation projects for the transit projects that we do. We, th we thought that was a no-brainer, but the utilities uh, may have had different ideas. So uh, working uh, all over last summer, kind of came up with a, a bill that it does require for new projects where UDOT... Uh, UTA doesn't already have an agreement with the utility or something like that, that we'll be able to do a 50-50 cost share for those transit projects. Uh, it also, uh, we did some things on behalf of the utilities at their request to emphasize that, that we'd coordinate with the utilities when we're relocating utilities, which we have no problem doing. So we'll see how that one works. It's still into the future till it'll be a while i think before we implement uh this um, because like if it's existing right of way and everything like that for uta that'll be subject to, to existing agreements so um, this is sp 235 railroad amendments and this creates we tried to get this name changed but Senator Harper really wanted it to be a rail ombudsman uh, to address disputes between local governments, property owners, and railroad companies. Uh, really, the railroad um, ombudsman, who will be within UDOT, doesn't really have much authority except for to call a meeting. That, that, that if, if a complaint comes in from, for example, a local government about something going on at a, a at grade rail crossing that that we we can get them in the room and union pacific or another rail company in the room and see if we can't work things out uh, this is kind of a, a middle ground because last year there was a rail safety office created in code but it keeps being pushed off a year so we're not sure if that rail safety office will ever be implemented or not this is sort of an in-between step this also authorizes us to use uh, udot to use eight hundred thousand dollars a year from an ongoing appropriation that we get in a rail restricted account uh, for statewide crossing maintenance this is significant because this is hopefully going to resol uh, resolve long standing disputes with unions Pacific and that we're going to be able to get moving on a lot of projects because we're going to come to some cooperation with on sharing maintenance costs at at grade crossings. Now this this uh, next bill is for uh, transit innovation grants and so that's why I put these rather fanciful pictures of what could you know what would be transportation intervention innovation but i don't expect any of them soon but uh this this bill started from uh representative prucci from her feeling that in harriman and then i think joined by at least the other participant that i saw most up on the hill was mayor fulmer of vineyard uh with their feeling that they uh, though they're paying obviously some sales tax uh, that goes towards transit, that there's no real transit service happening in their communities. Uh, there's 
other than some of the on-demand transit and things like that. And so that's where this bill came from. I don't know if, if UTA, do you want to talk about this one before me? I mean, I can, I can discuss it, but I, I thought you might want to. We just did rock, paper, scissors. Jay lost. Oh, I lost. Okay, very good. <laughs> um, well, why don't we go to the end of 4.30? Uh, so just to give you a little history of the Innovation Grant Program, this was a recommendation that came out of UEOC. Uh, was in the governor's uh, recommendations, uh, budget recommendations, at, uh, I think at two and a half million. And it was con originally conceived as a statewide program uh, to pilot projects that would improve transit in communities, not only on, on the Wasatch Front. Ultimately, that innovation program found its way into um, this uh, bill. Um, and the innovation grant program uh, became much more uh, actually exclusively about UTA um, assisting the funding of innovation grants for uh, pilot transit projects in our service area. Uh, the funding is capped at 10% of, I keep hearing myself all over the place, at 10% of the, uh, the fourth uh, uh, quarter. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to come from those, those revenues, but that's the amount of the funding for that program. Uh, also the bill uh, in its final form uh, created a reporting structure of UTA expenditures based on utilization uh, by um, people or residents of municipalities who are in our service area. And finally, it created a structure by which uh, UDOT would administer that grant program. Um, and so we're, you know, that grant program wouldn't kick off until July of 2025 under the current legislation. That's when those funds would have to be utilized. So we've got a little bit of time to work on that. Uh, that said, we've already had a meeting with the Southwest uh, Salt Lake County stakeholders. And so we're going to be in front of that, uh, we being UTA, working with a number of uh, municipalities if they anticipate themselves wanting to go in for grants under this pilot program uh, to help them formulate uh, those applications because ultimately they want to see those pilot programs become part of our service. And so we would want to assist them in uh, preparing those applications. The one last thing I'll say on this is, uh, and. Um, I mentioned this to uh, Carlos today. We've been talking about it internally at UTA. Is since we're a little over a year away from uh, July 2025, we'd still like to look at potential funding sources for this um, program because right now all of our operating funds are committed to existing service. Uh, so, you know, rather than potentially take away from that. You know, let's see if there are, let's keep looking at the funding sources for that so uh, it doesn't hit our uh, books in a, in a negative way. Um, but that said, um, the, the program we feel uh, very strongly about, this is a, a great opportunity to increase transit service uh, within our entire service area. And, uh, you know, we just want to do it as sustainably as we can. Peter, Peter, was that for rock, paper, scissors, by the way? Was it well, no, was, we had a new, mem new member join us here. Mayor, would you then introduce yourself? I'm Kathleen Alder. I am, I'm the mayor of Providence so, and CMPO chair. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> Peter, I just want to add really quickly on HB 430 also, one of the things that emerged out of all of the dialogue with the with the communities and with Representative Perucci, who did a great job of bringing stakeholders together, is a desire for more transit service. That's the that's the the key theme, is that all communities want to have transit as an option in their communities, and um, there's a lot of work that's underway to try to make sure that all communities have good transit service and that fast growing areas that may have, have fallen behind, their population growth has exceeded the expansion of transit service in those areas. How do we make sure those communities get service, but also not at the expense of other communities that 
that already have transit service. And so that's where this notion of the innovation grants um, emerged from. Uh, Riverton was very involved in that council member. Um, and then the, the um, applications can come in to UDOT. And I just want to express appreciation for UDOT's willingness to administer this program. They did not ask to administer this program, um, but they were, they were willing to do so because of the efficiency that would come from UDOT uh, being able to take in the money, the slice of money from UTA, uh, the use of TTIF dollars for capital costs, and sort of be able to pool together the available revenues so that it would be easier for local communities to apply. A local community can submit one application and say, here's an idea for innovative service, and it can be reviewed by one agency. So there's efficiency in doing that. Um, transit innovation grants is one thing, but it's not the only thing for helping communities to enhance their transit service. There's also the service planning. Jay, you've been talking about this and meeting with communities, and that's those things are coupled with the broader work that we all do here in looking at the longer range planning, Utah's unified transportation plan, thinking short range, mid and long range as we plan for transit and transportation more generally. And this is just one piece in that broader puzzle. Yeah, and I, I just wanna to add to that because I think it picks up on what you just said, this, these grants are conceived as local service grants. So they're piloting local service. And I think it's really important to, decouple that from the larger capital projects that a lot of communities would like to see, you know, extend, double tracking of front runner, extension of front runner, uh, additional BRT light rail service. Those are large investments that are not conceived by this program and that would, you know, be a function of actually the entire community, what I described as the we, uh, getting to uh, the funding and the prioritization of those projects. Just one real quick, that last piece about there there was some money in in this bill to stand up the process that you spoke of. So we'll be taking the time that between now and the implementation to to establish that process. We do have a current TTIF process that we're gonna try to use or leverage for that, but also as as Andrew mentioned, to try to keep it as simple as we can to to make this easy to for the for the cities. Peter, is there more? Uh, just didn't want to, we didn't want to leave you without knowing, without you knowing about the Governor Scott Matheson and Senator Jake Garn rest area, and also the Jake Garn legacy highway. So, uh, but we've named highways a lot. This is the first time I've seen in code where we've named a rest area. So, once, once the camel's nose is in the rest area tent, I'm sure we'll see many more to come. Uh, this, this bill put, uh, HB 50 put the West Davis Corridor on the map. <laughs> yeah. And uh, just uh, HB that's, 449. That's, a, that's, a, that's an annual bill to designate either move roads on and off the state system to local system or like a new road, so. Uh, this. My apologies, before you oh, go, go on, sure. on the West Davis Corridor, is that the piece of that, is that adding the second lane each way? Because I know that there was discussion about doing that and I didn't know if that was connected. There's two to the to the extension of West Davis Corridor. Sorry, I should no, have this, been this, 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 this action was the piece that's physically open today. Oh, We're working okay. on the environmental documents for two pieces going north right now. Okay, and thank so you. So those will, those will come. This also had a, a piece come off the state system onto the local system, kind of the tail end of Bangor Highway um, is going to the city of Draper. So, uh, um, this one just added that one thing that, uh, along with pedestrian safety, that we'll look at bicycle safety when we're doing UDOT projects. We 
cooperated with the sponsors of this legislation because uh, UDAP recently rewrote its policies to say that we'd consider all active transportation for any of our projects. Uh, so that's even more encompassing than, than just pedestrians and bicycles. Um, a great I, addition, thank you. And uh, this is what happens if you ask chat GPT to make a picture of drones, electric bikes, snow plows, and motorcycles, and road rage all at once. But this is kind of a smorgasbord of some of the additional bills. I don't know if there's any of them that anybody wanted to discuss. Um, the one that maybe is in, was interesting to me might not be interesting to anybody else sb 135 advanced air mobility and aeronautics amendments every year we are we've been making uh at the request of the legislature uh, adding things to our advanced air mobility code to demonstrate that utah is is interested in that in innovation in that area and being a leader in that area and uh to inside baseball how how weird politics can be the mercatus institute put out a study saying who was what states were the best uh at advanced air mobility and which were the worst and utah ranked really low because we had no uh statutory language saying that we would lease airspace for advanced air mobility even though the FAA currently doesn't allow anyone to lease that space. Uh, so we, working with the sponsor, came up with language that still makes it clear that the FAA would have to approve it, but that we will indeed consider leasing airspace when that day comes. And that's the kind of things you do so that think tanks can say that you're uh, leading, leading the charge on these kind of industries. Does that include beachfront property on the Great Salt Lake? <laughs> no. The, uh, uh, well, I wanted to, or I was. Let me turn. Let me just. Yeah. I mean, there's a couple things that happen in the drone area. One is um, 47G, uh, which is an association of our aerospace defense companies, got funding to stand up a. Um, Center of Excellence, correct? Yeah. Yeah. A Center of Excellence. They recently hired a impressive director for that effort. And the effort, the funding that we received for to advance, build, basically build a sandbox for uh, drone companies to be able to test and deploy. We're all working together to try to make Utah the place um, where this technology can evolve and develop and be deployed early on. So. A lot of exciting things happening in this area. Anything else, Peter? Uh, I don't know if you wanted to Do you want talk to about the one. Yeah, I, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little bit of numbers here. Um, so oh, it, that picture is incomplete. I don't know if you want to share. Uh, your slide of it it's not quite it over it not quite complete or correct um so lots of action on the budget side um, we received all of our i'll say internal requests a lot of work we do is moving money across line items and so we had a lot of work going on in that area um, but in terms of quote new money coming into the system the uh, if you remember last year's session, the legislature identified 1.1 billion dollars of what they referred to as high risk money that would be basically set aside and um, would be considered in the first 10 days of legislative session, which is code for base budget. And so the base budget went through uh, with the 1.1 billion dollars going into TIF. That's the amount that will essentially pay for all of our outstanding bonds. We're paying bonds um, through 2036 to pay off the bonds. 
Um, and so, you know, that money just got plopped into TIF with the expectation to accelerate um, projects, to backfill projects with the cost increases. You may recall in 2021, our projects saw about a 16% increase across the board. We we build a 5% increase into these. We have over $5 billion of projects programmed, so you can picture a, the differential between 5% and 16%, 11% increase on $5 billion is a lot of money. So to help backfill that, we're starting to see inflation go down. 2022 was 12% uh, and we were 8% in 2023. So we're hoping to get back to that 5% here, which will hopefully help us manage that. So the 1.1 was meant to try to accelerate and backfill projects as well as give the commission the ability to um, program other projects as well. And Tiffany's gonna talk about the commission workshop process coming up. Um, that is um, gonna be a, uh, I think a pretty significant um, process that we have going on over the next three months. I will mention that the uh, 1.1 billion evolved during the session. Um, we saw a, you know, there there was a request from the governor's office to try to do more for uh, affordable housing, and so the uh, the amount of money, the 1.1 billion in FY uh, 25, was changed to uh, seven seven uh, was changed to 475 thousand one time and 330 ongoing. Um, so that's the amount of money coming in in FY25. And then the ongoing is going to be $330 million every year going forward. Um, going into the sessions, going into Friday night, it was 335. It changed to 330 um, to help basically balance the budget. So that $300 million that would, was peeled off to go for loans for affordable, affordable housing um, will come back into TIF in FY28. So eventually the full 1.1 will, will be recognized um, in there. I, I think the one-time money is nice, but that ongoing money of 330 is, is unbelievable. When you, when you consider TIF right now is generating, I, I use round numbers, about a billion dollars a year of uh, money coming into TIF. Um, an additional $330 million is a pretty significant increase to our capacity program. And it really helped um, convince leadership that the 1% going to TTIF was doable. Because their concern was we have so much need, we don't want to take away from that capacity program. And so, um, like I said, that, that I think was the most significant part on the funding piece. But if you talk to our folks, we got, you know, almost everything we asked for. One thing we asked for, which was during COVID in the special session, so it was at May of 2020, all the state agencies were asked to take cuts. And so we identified our lowest priority, uh, which was picking up trash and dead animals off the road. And it was $1.8 million of that effort. And so they took that money from the transportation fund, moved the transportation fund into TIF because that can only constitutionally be used for state roads and then freed up general fund and took that general fund money back. And I asked, can I have that 1.8 back so we can pick up more trash and dead animals? And that's the one thing we did not get um, back. But I mean, we're, we're gonna fund five new traffic signal um, technicians, buy trucks for them. We're adding new traffic signals across the state like crazy and we're so far behind on being able to maintain and keep them operating stormwater folks um, five, four more five more positions for stormwater folks were we're in a consent decree with epa in terms of how the state deals with stormwater so we have to contain and make sure any water that runs off the pavement is clean before it's discharged into a water of the u.s and so um, we needed more help to be able to do that. If you think about every pipe that goes under the road, every storm sewer system, every maintenance station, every one of those areas is that potential source. So, uh, and we got a bunch of stuff, you know, of, of helping us internally. So I thought that was really good. Um, 
couple nights before the end of the session, got a call, can you spend $50 million on broadband? Um, there was some ARPA money that was going um, to a local government. They were not able to spend the money. We need to have the money spent, actually paid to a contractor by December of 26. And we said, sure, we have plenty of broadband projects. And so um, we helped out in that way. And uh, I call it help. <laughs> we uh, we took some money in, and so um, that's. I think that's. Dan, am I missing anything on budget that I should mention? That, the what? The uh, yeah. So the fifty million for Point of the Mountain Transit that is being. The wording is different than last year. It's much the same concept. Um, we don't have access to that until base budget of next year, but we're going to plan on it. And so what you'll see, one of the things is we, we're we working on a new front runner station at Point of the Mountain for the Point of the Mountain development. Last year we said that was $400 million with UTA. We received $200 million. And so you're going to see us count on that $50 million and then probably program I, my commission has to make that decision but our recommendation initially right now is three years worth of that new 50 million is going to go towards that front runner station so we can fully fund that piece yeah that, and that would be in that commuter rail sub account yep funding okay. yeah the other thing we didn't mention that um Lenise and the utah county folks might want to know the uh we got intent language on the uh, sharp tentic line and so um, that basically, um, I'll say, encouraged us. I told them we, we would do it anyhow, but they wanted to have that language in there. Um, and so that will encourage, um, tells us to use TTIF to help advance that sharp tinted rail consolidation. And I talked to Carlton about this, right when we're, and Jeff, right when we're in the middle of it. And, you know, it's, it's a good project. That's what I told leadership. So. Yeah, that's a 16 million appropriation, I believe, for that one. Well, there wasn't new money to it. So there was no appropriation. It was intent okay. language telling us to spend our own money to do it. Okay, okay. So we, that would be through our TTIP process. Got it, okay. It's on the it's on the TTIP ranked list. It's, so, it's available for that process. Perfect. <laughs> so we need a nomination. <laughs> so Carlos, are they, uh, just because I've noticed it, are they, do you have a solution to clean up dead animals and trash <laughs> along the freeway? It, I know, it's actually gotten pretty bad this last year and a half. I just we hear that. that. Uh, yes, we're uh, you know we're spending you know right now this time of year, and you can imagine this. It's our priority is holding on to our operations money for being able to plow snow, and as the risk of snow starts to decrease, we start to free up money for other priority projects. I'll be honest, the priorities that I have right now are fixing our bridge decks. We're on a we're on a very serious decline on our bridge condition statewide. And we're spending preservation money to do maintenance activities to fix bridges. That is going to be that is a sleeping giant that we're going to have to deal with going forward. So, you know, if I have a choice to pick up trash or to fix a pothole on a bridge deck, I'm going to fix a bridge deck. And that's that's kind of the trade-offs we're making, but where we can, we're picking them up. Anyone? Yeah. Um, I didn't know too if, if uh, WFRC wanted to talk at all about uh, SB two sixty eight or two zero eight, the biz. Yeah, I mean, this is mainly a transportation meeting. Um, but that ties into development generally and housing specifically. And so I'll just take one minute on this. Um, first, Carlos mentioned importantly already uh, the 775, 775 million one time money uh, that's going into the TIF. You said this already, but just to make sure everybody's clear on this, also $300 million is pulled out of the TIF to be used for low interest loans for housing. This was during the session, this was referred to as the PTIF, but the mechanism changed and those monies are available for short-term loans for, for, um, to increase affordable housing development. 
and then will be repaid back to the TIF. Uh, so ultimately, it's the benefit of the 775, but $300 million available for housing, which is terrific. Um, in addition, there were lots of housing bills this year, lots. And I'm not going to go over all of them by any stretch. I'll just note that our friends in local government, um, many of whom are here in the room, were pleased because what the legislature did this year is uh, a partnership, not pr a preemption approach. Mayor Shepard's nodding at that. Um, in that tools were provided to local governments rather than mandates being imposed on, on local governments. And I'll just note quickly two of those tools, um, one of which is a, um, one that's already in place right now, HTRZ, the Housing and Transit Reinvestments on South Jordan has an HTRZ uh, coming online. This is a way to bring all of the taxing entities together to contribute a portion of the tax increment that's generated by a project development around a high capacity transit station. Uh, the new uh, track station that's coming online um, in daybreak in South Jordan, for example, an HTRZ around that. Uh, the legislation made some slight modifications to HTRZ, including increasing the percentage of the homes that are around and in the HTRZ development that have to be affordable, and also added an objective to have owner-occupied housing um, in HTRZs. So that was some modifications there. Similarly, a new tool was created this year called the First Home Investment Zones, or FIZ. Um, by the way, both of these are sponsored by Senator Harper, who just carried the, 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 like the weight of Atlas you know, um, on, he, he was the number one legislator in terms of bills passed this session. And like half of the bills that we've gone through today were Senator Harper bills. And it's just, it's really quite, quite remarkable, worth noting. Anyway, the FIS is a new tool that is similar to HTRZ and then it uses tax increment to help develop city and town centers, but it's for areas where an, a city can't do an HTRZ. I mean, it's HTRZ is around high capacity transit stations and a FIS can be in areas that are not those areas anywhere else in a city um, at a relatively lower density than an HTRZ. HTRZ is 50 units per acre, FIS is 30 units per acre. But similarly, it sets an expectation, a requirement actually, that the proposal consider housing in relation to transportation and parks and public spaces and economic development. So thinking about good planning city and town centers. Uh, this is the direction of the Wasatch Choice vision that we talk about here. Um, uh, it also provides a little more flexibility because if a city can't meet that 30 units per acre requirement, they can actually reduce that density requirement within the zone by doing additional housing outside of the zone, but anywhere in the city that's owner occupied as long as it's at a density requirement of six units per acre. So it provides a degree of flexibility but tools to encourage, facilitate the development of more housing and have that be coordinated with transportation. Um, there's a lot more detail to that, which I won't go into, but I will say that I know Miranda and Lanise have created let summaries of individual bills and then also a lot of the things we've gone over uh, here today. And I'm sure would be happy uh, to share that with the JPAC members um, coming out of this meeting. Thank you, Andrew. Any other questions on legislation? Ben, did you? Okay. Of course, we can always come back to anything if anything comes up. We wanted to spend some time talking about what we call our uh, UDOT programming workshop that we have coming up. We do it every year. Uh, we basically work throughout the year with the Transportation Commission on, you know, looking at our strategic plan, looking at the targets, the conditions of the infrastructure, where the needs at, um, and uh, we in March will typically have a, you know, five six hour meeting where we go through in detail the um, the needs of the system. We're setting the commission up for help, you know, for them to make some hard choices because there's not enough money to do everything that everyone wants to do. Um, and Tiffany's going to, we, we kind of think of this as the cycle of life <laughs> because it all revolves around us, right? Of course. So Tiffany's going to talk about a little bit. She's, this is probably her 
big focus right now for her area. She's responsible for helping the commission with these hard decisions. Thanks, Carlos. Tiffany Pocock with Program Development. I apologize. I don't have any AI-generated uh, content in my presentation, yeah, so right. let's learn for the next uh for the next meeting. Uh, yeah, a lot of the process that we're going through, Carlos just hinted at, um, but the elevator version of what's what I like to say is good infrastructure costs less. And as, as it's been hinted, we keep adding to our assets, our signals, our structures, our pavement, our signs, our uh, many assets out there that are growing and we have a finite budget, both that we get from the state and uh, federal government, where as Carlos mentioned, we have to make kind of a push-pull decision um, for recommendation to our Transportation Commission in a public meeting that's coming up in March. And so, yes, we have lots of people working on what those programs should look like, how we should fund them, how we should try to preserve them and keep them in good um, condition. We also look at, you know, state is growing, and so we have capacity programs as well. Uh, it's been hinted at that we you know, got an insurgence of some of funds for both our, our TIF and TTIF. So in the March meeting, you'll see some recommendations for that as well. But in, in May, you will see more of the project level lists once uh, we get approval from our commission on what the programming fund, funds look like. At the end of the process, what we look forward to is an approved STIP working with um, our partners at FHWA and FTA. Um, this is that process that uh, we've been kind of hinting at. It is uh, several stages long. March, uh, again, we're going to our commission with recommendations on program levels, um, and then coming back in May with uh, hopefully an approval for what those programs look like, and we'll have suggestions then on which projects, which corridors need the attention of our uh, infrastructure maintenance the, the most, as well as where we would like to um, again, because of our growth, where we should be adding capacity on all levels for first mile, last mile projects, our trail networks, our highways, our uh, transit projects, um, with finally a, a step at the at the August or sorry the yeah in August. August. To, and to, and just we use the term program and projects, and they're different. So when we talk program, when you, when you're trying to set a say a condition for pavements statewide, for high volume pavements, you know, the, the pavements that see a lot of traffic. You know, you, we use asset management systems to try to say, well, if we have this amount of money in the entire program, then we can get, achieve this target, this condition. And so it's for, you know, so we, we say for pavements, we need X amount of money. For bridges, we need X amount of money. That's the program. And then once we get pro agreement on the program amount, then we will break that down into projects, individual projects. Uh, yeah, any questions on on the process or how we're looking forward to a, net the next couple of months of, of fun? Tiffany, I don't have a question. I just want to a comment, for particularly for the local elected officials that participate here. The processes that the MPOs go through to develop the plans, the Unified Transportation Plan, the Regional Transportation Plans, um, that process, which is locally driven, but in partnership with UDOT and UTA, feeds into the commission and the UDOT programming process. The projects that are identified, I'm simplifying, but the projects that are identified in phase one of the long range plans, then go through the prioritization process from the commission and the department. So we all work really hard, and this is part of that national model stuff that we were talking about, to weave all of these processes uh, together. Add to that the fact that local, local communities can always offer input and comment to the commission and to UDOT as you're doing your stage of the work. Well, and, and so, you know, that comment pertains mostly to the capacity projects that go through. A lot of what we're gonna be talking about in March is actually dealing with the system dealing with uh, you know taking care of what we have yeah. and operating the system um, and so all the regions have region workshops and that's where they invite the local government officials to participate in those region workshops and so a lot of what you're you know that that's for us the opportunity for the local governments to say the pavement on this road stinks we need work out here or we need help with this merge here and it's that region workshops that take place in 
January usually, Ben, is that when they took it's place February. this year? January, February. Those are what feed into then recommendations in March for um, kind of program programmatic levels and then individual project levels. So I know it's, we ask a lot of the elected officials, um, you know, you're, you're attending a meeting here. We're, we want to attend the MPO meetings, the planning meetings, and then all the other meetings that the MPOs have to, you know, to prepare. And then, oh, by the way, go to a region workshop meeting and come to a, a commission STIP meeting. There's, we ask a lot of you, um, but we think it's important for it to help you understand those touch points. Your staffs work very closely with our teams. And so that's where a lot of your input is coming through is your teams. So I got the thumbs up from Andrew, so. <laughs> so that, that March workshop, March 21st in this room, also streamed live on YouTube for those that want to. Oh, okay. I guess I'll turn online. Does anyone online want to say anything or ask any questions? I don't see any hands. Okay. Not seeing any. Tiffany, are you, do you have more? Next. Oh, I don't have any more on the process. On that, on that process. Okay. That's just somebody joining, Grant? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll figure out these no noises. Um, so seeing no questions or comments, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about from the federal side, some grant opportunities. And Ivan, were you prepared to, to give out some grants here today? Today, right, right up over there, I'll be in the, the lobby. I knew it was worth more than just the lunch to come here. That's great. Yeah, uh, we. I am going to go over some uh, opportunities that are are open today um, and open that we're looking forward to on the horizon. Um, but first, I wanted to go over what the USDOT strategic direction is, and I welcome Ivan to help at any point here. Um, but just to really highlight, if you are going to go after a, a grant application, you know, what sort of, uh, you know, backbone themes uh, the USDOT is looking for. And then if you are new to the grant world, where you can go to find resources, um, and, and then again, where your funding opportunities are now and what we're looking forward to um, in the very near future. So this is the USDOT strategic um, plan for grant applications. And so I'm not going to read this to you, but just keep these in mind when you are looking at grant opportunities, uh, because largely they want to see applications that match that plan. Um, I don't have pictures, but I do have cool QR codes that can take you to the um, to the websites of the uh, tools that I'm, I'm sharing with you today. The, D the first one is the DOT Navigator, and if you are new to grants, it's a great place to go to see webinars, um, find out what grants, what grants, like the acronyms mean for grants that you might be interested in, um, and other resources, maps that help you understand uh, in your uh, local jurisdiction um, where you can uh, apply for certain um, funding opportunities. So that's the first, that would be my recommendation for the first stop. Go and, um, if you are new to the grants world, kind of uh, use those tools. The next is the funding opportunities. We do have, um, that are currently open, uh, but this is a good website to go to frequently to understand um, when certain um, what we call NOFOs or notice of funding opportunities will be open to um, the application status and you can start working on your application. And then finally is the last resource is the grants.gov. Um, that's where you would submit your grant application. Uh, however, I'll go over a little bit more about the facilitation and how FHWA works with UDOT um, as far as administration goes. I'm not going to read this. This is th this and the next couple of slides are really just a um, supposed to be a wow factor. It is grant season and lots more grants coming. Uh, but these are the ones that are currently open. Um, I wanted to kind of highlight the safe streets uh, and roads for all as a kind of because we have a, a large kind of local presence in this meeting. Um, those are um, you know specifically aimed for locals uh, down even including school districts. Oh yeah, that one's already taken. Okay. <laughs> 
Um, again, just wow factor, uh, what we're looking at as far as March um, and April, these are all grant opportunities that we are hearing are, are coming on the horizon um, and wanted to share with you all. These will all be on the, on the resource um, and, and will be released at the, at the NOFO uh, website. Um, we are looking forward to some, um, the, rest of, the rest of this fiscal year is, again, grant season. We are hearing that there's going to be a lot of opportunity for funding, both in large mega projects down to, again, this kind of the state, well, I guess safe streets is taken. So that's the word on the street now. Uh, but I wanted to offer up program development as a resource. Um, I, like I mentioned, we uh, are the uh, facilitator of a lot of the grant applica applications and submissions. And so if you have questions about grants or uh, would like to uh, apply for a grant, our, our team is available to help you as well as uh, we often provide letters of support for uh, grant applications that um, can help with, with your um, you know, desire for whatever grant opportunity you're, you're going for. Um, but just please coordinate early. If you do uh, see a NOFO that comes out or a webinar that says that a NOFO might be coming out soon, um, please coordinate and we can help facilitate your submission, a, uh, a letter of support, and uh, any questions that you have because it's been a, a, learning, a learning opportunity for our group to kind of um, now get into the cycle of, of grants uh, opportunities. And just because uh, you're not ready maybe for a NOFO that's upcoming, a lot of these grants are, what's the right word, Re revolving or recurring? Recurring. Um, so if you don't, if you're not ready or don't have match now, you kind of can maybe put it on your horizon for opportunities in the future. So we are a resource. If you want uh, more information or you have questions, please let us know. Let me just say real quick, uh, thanks for that great uh, overview, Tiffany. Closer? There we go. Okay. Oops. A little um, so um, thank you, Tiffany. Great overview. And uh, yes, there are a lot of grants out there. They are very complicated. If you go to one of those NOFOs or, and start reading through it, it can be overwhelming. Uh, like an additional resource would be our office. We do have a person in our office who's specifically dedicated to assisting with these grants. Uh, they work as, uh, as people, uh, as uh, agencies receive these grants. They, they, we will work with them to put the agreements together, which is another lengthy process and complicated also, and then uh, help them move forward. So uh, beyond the help that you can get from you that our office here in Salt Lake City can, can, is available to help with that too. It's well worth the effort though. Winning, winning a grant is just a lot of fun. <laughs> There are literally dozens of new federal discretionary grant programs from the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which is both good and challenging. And I imagine like for some of the local elected officials in the room, you're like, like, okay, where do we start? And one, I mean, everybody's saying, we've got resources, we can help you, and that's true. Um, it's a bit of a mix and match game. And if you have a need that, that you're aware of, one thing to do is to say, here's an investment that we need to make in our community. Hey, UDOT, FHWA, MAG, WFRC, whoever your agency is, is do you, are you aware of a program that this might be a good candidate for? We can help you do mixing and matching. Um, that's sort of, that is one sort of initial step to entry in some of this uh, game. Well, it's not really a game, but it feels sometimes like a game because there's just so many programs. I'll just add to that. It reminded me when you said that, that there are opportunities for, I don't know if this is the right term, but for uh, complementary match situations. You know, if, you, if we've got a state program like TTIF first mile, last mile, and then there's a, fed, that, that requires a, a local match, and then there's a federal grant that requires a match, you know, sometimes we can look, help look for those opportunities. We've done, that's, there's been some of those that have happened in the past where we can match up federal grants that require match and use the, the state money for that. And so just keep that in mind as well, especially when, you, you know, the, the established programs like TTIF first mile, last mile, or the active transportation TIF active in, in our TIF program. Those are two, two programs that this could work with for sure.
So, Andrew, with what you were saying, well, it is a game because you win, right? But besides that, you guys do a better job of keeping track of all those grants than we do. If we just start with Wasatch Front Regional Council, would, would you be able to guide us to the other places to find those grants? So we don't have to go to all the different organizations? Yeah, and that, yes, Mayor. And that's part of the idea is that it's, it's what our agencies can help do is try to make it streamlined for you, more streamlined. Um, and, and what we may end up doing is saying, hey, this is a project that could be a good candidate for X program. And you know who would be the right folks to talk to would be to get with you, Dot, you know, to do the matching as Ben is talking about. But the answer is yes. Basically, there's no wrong door here. If you come to us, we'll help you. If you come to, you know, uh, really any of our agencies, we're all, we're all happy to help. Okay. There's no wrong door. However, UDOT is the coolest. <laughs> but in all in all sincerity, sorry, um, we do we do work with FHWA and are often involved in the administration. So even if it's just a heads up of hey, I'd like to go after this, and you do end up working with um, WFRC or MAG on the opportunity of the application, please just work that, with us. That's great. And since you are so cool, if you'd like to stop in City Hall once a week, I have a little office where you could hang out and we could. <laughs> With that, with you. A quick question on all of that. So, uh, you know, oftentimes with these federal grants, uh, if an applicant has never received a federal grant, that's a huge demerit because of a question of their ability to comply with the terms of the grant. So how often are we, our cities, able to work with UDOT, with other organizations uh, to be partners on grant administration to boost that application success? Are you guys yeah. offering that as part of your partnering or well this this is a it's an interest some of the grants have to go through us and we you know we administer all the local government monies um, we have to sign the contracts we're responsible that it complies with the you know 23 CFR um, but now as part of the IJA the locals have the opportunity to go I'll say around the state directly to the federal government and to get that you're required then to meet all those federal requirements. What Tiffany was trying to say is, if you're gonna apply, great, but it'd be great if we're part of that discussion because we don't have a lot of extra resources to help administer the project. My goal is that we help you be successful because it is... Well, and I guess my question is not so much, I don't think not a lot of cities need help with administering it, but they need the appearance of support in no, order to get there's not money. a single city in this state that has the ability to administer one of these contracts yeah i'm saying that bluntly you don't have the no no city has the infrastructure in place to be able to do it so what what's the state doing to help communities prepare for that beyond just talking about that in this room Curious. well we're, what we're saying is if you're going to go and apply for one in your own name Bring us to the table with you, because we're totally. And if I you if you get a contract, and then poor yeah. Ivan is like, he's going to come to us and say, "Can you step in and help?" Yeah. And if we can, if we didn't have an ability to be planning and getting ready for it, we're not going to be able to help. That totally makes sense. I'm just saying, outside of this meeting, is there outreach that's going on to communities about the resources available, um, and just kind of helping them prepare for that, and just. What's that look like? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's it's it's <clears throat> there's so many outreaches that happen with navigators and lists and everything that I think that from a local perspective it probably it just sort of like the risk is it sort of fades into the background noise, right? Um, we could probably all point to oh well we sent this notice and this email, but like it's a it's better it's better to have as a conversation about if there's a, a particular need that you're looking at or targeting to then have that conversation almost informally um so that we can be more targeted in the approach and then figure out well does it make sense for the city to apply directly or well you don't even need to go to a discretionary new discretionary grant program because we already administer the STP program, which is you know $45 million a year. Apply there or apply directly to UDOT or have UDOT apply. There's no one right answer to it. It's just a matter of having that dialogue. I will say that um, we have a technical advisory committee 
uh, committees that are made up of community city and county staff, the, the planners, the engineers, the public works directors. Um, and, and those are the people that are doing this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis. And UDOT and UTA and the MPOs participate in those meetings. And we go into more of the detail about these things in those conversations. So in, a, in one sense, council member, and really this is true for any of the local government officials, for you to be working with your city staff saying, how are you pursuing this? Are we pursuing this? Would probably be literally the first step. Yeah, and I'm not so much asking for Riverton. We're, we're already doing this and yeah. coordinated on. I'm just curious how those that may not be as plugged in are yeah. able to get plugged in. Thanks. Good discussion. Anything more on grants? I'll tell you, the uh, Andy, the, the National League of Cities put together some absolutely phenomenal boot camps on training cities at a, I mean, at our level, how to apply for grants and how to do it properly. And they've been so successful that cities that, that would likely never have been able to apply for a grant have been able to receive them. Yeah, aimed at smaller cities. Again, the applying part seems daunting, but that's the easy part. <laughs> it's executing it and administering the contract. So there's a lot that goes into that. So thank you for doing the easy part. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Mayor. <laughs> okay, um, let's see here. Other business. Is there anything else that anyone would like to discuss? today you can see the upcoming meetings that we have already on the calendar um, are we planning here then who, who where online. oh question online thank you they are not on the board. Ultimately, the legislature, I think, Peter, the legislature's got the responsibility for um, this, the scenic byway decisions, for segmentation, and for new routes on the... Yeah, correct. The, the, that bill is the one that took the most time and ended up... Doing uh, the least. <laughs> yeah, doing the least. It, it, first of all, it kind of changed the whole thing with a new ad hoc committee and that was going to include a billboard representative and then that got pulled back and instead of sunsetting the original committee which what's going to happen is that committee still exists the same as it was same membership and the only change is that a final designation is voted on by the legislature so the things that uh, many constituents and interested parties were most concerned about ended up not happening did that did that answer the question okay jay i just want to take just one moment to thank wfrc as well as mag for those weekly legislative briefings they're really just so helpful during the session and it just, a, just gives a chance for a lot of people to come together with different viewpoints and discuss where we are. So just thank you for that. <laughs> yes, Mayor. Ben, I think you, you mentioned there was a meeting on March 21st. I wasn't sure what meeting you meant. Is it just a transportation commission meeting on March 21st? That's not a meeting that the rest of us, most, most of us are going to be there. I just wanted it's to make sure because I don't have a March 21st on my calendar. <laughs> I just need to make sure. Yeah, that's our that's our first programming workshop. So it's the normally we have staff update on the Thursday before the Friday of commission meetings that are, you know, we have generally monthly. Um, but March 21st is the programming workshop. So it's the first of the series of programming workshops. Um, so it's it's open if you want to come. It's not a required but to come. It's online wanted, too. I just was looking for a clear. Actually, I really yeah. liked the Transportation Commission meeting that I went to out in Tooele County recently. I thought yeah. that was great. Yeah. Um, and I like being nerdy with like-minded people in this room who really like that kind of thing. And like, anyway, I thought it was fun. But <laughs> I just wanted to make sure what that 21st yeah. was because yeah. I didn't have it. And I thought I just need to clarify. All are all are welcome. Nobody's required to attend, other than the Utah folks and the commissioners. Okay, thanks, Mayor. I thought you were going to talk about 
I thought you were going to talk about tumbleweeds. Okay. <laughs> the interview I did yesterday with a radio station in um, Australia, that was a really fun one. They have a segment every week called um, Take Me There, and they go somewhere in the world. And yesterday they came to South Jordan, Utah, and I got to talk about our tumbleweeds. So dumb. So funny. But it's it's literally, it's been in Ireland, it's been on the BBC, and it's been on all of the national level media. And ABC4 reached out today to see if they could come do an interview about it. And and it feels like old news now, so I'm here instead of talking to them. So I'm sorry. Hey, you, try, you try so hard to get an image and you know of the community, and could you have ever dreamed that tumbleweeds? Okay, the only upside, which I am grateful for, is if we're going to have this, you know, free unsolicited press, whatever, that it's not because of scandal or a tragedy. Nobody died. There's no, you know, permanent damage. There's no loss of life. There's no corruption. There's not, this is the best kind of free media you could hope for. We're just trying to make it light and give some, you know, levity and just be a little brighter over Super Tuesday and all the things that have been going on. We're just, in a bright spot with our bizarre humbleweed story. So, yeah, thanks. Well, there, Ramsey, I want to thank you for being the filter on catching those before they got to West Jordan. <laughs> I have worried a little bit. We took more than 13 dumpsters, the 30 yard dumpsters, out to the landfill. And, you know, those, those things are terrible. They stick together. If they blow out of the landfill and roll into West Jordan, they're going to come like a tornado like they're all going to be connected so hopefully not we've done everything we can to avoid that if they do i'll call you just come get her hey carlos just to circle back on the um, animal and trash the animal and trash pickup funding you know next session i think a lot of communities would be more than happy to be supportive and be advocates for that being reinserted into your budget because it impacts all of us um yep. so just Thank let us know how we could be partners on that. Thank you. You know, it was, um, we got it included in the governor's budget. The, uh, the term they were using, this was a socks and underwear budget year. And uh, so anything with general fund was a uh, big target. So, yeah. Okay. I've been talking to, <laughs> I've been talking to the lieutenant governor's office about getting some cleanup on the highways. We go down to Arizona often, and their streets and highways look really nice, and ours are full of trash. And, you know, if we can involve the cities and involve citizens, it doesn't need to be all UDOT to do that, but it would be nice to get them picked up because they look terrible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. It's, um, it's, I mean, we had our Region 2 administrative staff last summer go out and these are office people go out and pick up along i-215 and it looked good for about 10 days after 10 days it looked like they had never picked up anything it's remarkable how fast the trash piles up so pass a law that can't litter. <laughs> no, i think there is one carlos i just want to note before you wrap up that online we we were joined earlier uh oh, by oh. mayor kafusi from provo who is the chair of the mag mpo and also Commissioner Bob Stevenson, Davis County, who's the vice chair of WFRC, who I believe is joining us from the Metro. Yeah, and it looks like he's on the train. Yeah, so <laughs> thanks for joining, guys. Commissioner, Mayor, thank you for joining. Um, I will note that, you know, I am looking for topics you would like to talk about, Beth. Thank you, I'm sorry, I interrupted your flow a little bit, but I did want to also um, just invite everyone slash remind them that we're having our transit academy um it's in may may 21st i believe sorry shul's right behind me and can correct me oh Eva. um and i would really like to have everyone come that can because we're really going to try to like get you guys um to get the operator's perspective so i want to see you guys operating a train safely and not on our actual system just as a just as a reminder but anyway i just wanted to put that out there yeah, you don't has a snow plow we have a train jay's still smiling so you didn't scare him too much there Beth. okay if we don't what wreck I the snow plow we can wreck the train <laughs> there you go mayor so if you don't have a topic right now that you'd like to put forward 
hopefully oh yes carlton uh, we're just in the uh final process as a sort of aftermath of the unified transportation plan of doing an economic study on transit and its contribution uh, not only to the economy but also to the value of the whole transportation system i think that would be an interesting be topic, topic to review and go through you some think, of the outcomes you think it could be ready for june uh i think so yeah, yeah i think that's a good that'd be great for... thank you and anyone else if you have something of interest you think might be or helpful for us on our planning efforts on our coordination efforts please get us that information we'd love to help facilitate bringing the conversation forward mayor if i can get a, put a plug in to fix the bridge decks going to and from the airport we uh, we yeah, have a, we have we're, we're putting together a project to bring in front of the commission the commission's going to see a project proposal on this this commission meeting on i15 if you can think about it we we opened i15 may of 20, of 2001 those bridges were designed for a 50 year life but that 50 year life means that we're replacing decks and doing rehab on those continue you know pretty much on a periodic basis and so we're looking to put together a program to do the bridges on i15 and we're also working on a proposal for those 215 bridges out by the airport because our poor region director hears it from me as well the one bridge that goes um, northbound from 80 to 215, I counted 15 hubcaps off the side of the road. So I thought, ah, yeah, I mean, it. so you're you're you see the the potholes in the asphalt, but it's rotting from the steel in the deck. So the steel is rotting, and so it's really you really can't stop that corrosion when it gets that way. Mayor, you're seeing all those hubcaps suggests you either count really fast or drive really slow i'm not sure which or she's a collector i drive often <laughs> okay um so again feed us things that you think would be interesting for us all to learn together and we do have you can see the three meetings there the september 19th meeting is going to be rescheduled there are too many conflicts so we're going to try to find a meeting date for that we're, we're thinking of doing the meetings here other than possibly doing one at Region 2, which is just to the north of us a little bit, because that would then give us access if anyone's interested in a tour of the Traffic Operations Center. And I don't know how many people have had a chance to go through there, but that's really the nerve center for the state transportation system. And so if there's an interest in that, let us know. We will, uh, we will try to get that through, you know, get that input from you through email and ideas from email so with that ben anything else anything online do we see i don't see any hands i appreciate everyone online being patient with us while we worked out the audio here um grant anyone on you see anything online okay that's mayor silverstein he's questioning commissioner stevenson <laughs> you know i'm on this on this train just so carlton the path can see if i can turn around here you know what it's not full so even washington dc has problems with getting people on the train all the time you know, whatever silver screen he's saying don't believe a word i think this guy's oh. this guy's a, this guy's a democrat it's all in county that's all i know <laughs> you guys aren't far enough apart i think three thousand miles isn't enough it looks like okay okay with that anyone who would like to go out and get in a snow plow we'll see if you can drive it or um see what they let us do ben's grimacing at me um we're i'm gonna say uh motion to adjourn so moved uh, all in favor say aye second for the mayor aye okay thank you guys <laughs>